All right, guys, Urban Sentinel here. I'm going to go over um, a subject that has definitely been popping up on people's uh, searches everywhere. One, if you're an individual that has an underground bunker, 2,800 square feet of safety and security with steel walls and six feet worth of dirt and concrete on top of you, this video is not for you. This video is for people that live in apartment buildings, that rent houses, that may own their own house, but it's on a tiny piece of land. And this is for people who don't have the money to get themselves a fallout shelter. This is about makeshift fallout shelters strictly for the reduction of your exposure to radioactive particles. And let me just make a clear definition. This is not about protecting you from radiation. In the event that there is a nuclear incident, the radiation is out there. It's penetrating everything. So again, unless you've got a bunker or you've got three to six feet worth of dirt stacked on top of one to two feet worth of concrete, and you're sitting inside a room that has at least half inch thick steel walls with 1962 lead paint on the inside of it, you're going to get exposed to radiation. What this video is about is ways to mitigate the exposure to contaminated particles that may be airborne and blowing around because that's the primary issue. It's less about the radiation itself and don't get me wrong, radiation exposure is a serious and ends up being a consequently deadly thing. But it's the exposure to contaminated particles where the majority of people that aren't even near the actual blast site, whether it's a nuclear blast, whether it's a release of radioactive gases and materials, or whether it's a, a dirty bomb explosion, whatever it is, it's usually the wind-blown airborne particles that have been irradiated that cause the problem. So what you need to be able to do within those confines of, like I said, your apartment, which you may not own, you can't do the type of heavy duty work needed. A house, you may own it, but you don't have the money to have a bunker dropped in or to have walls reinforced with cinder blocks filled with sand and dirt packed on the outside. You have what you have for the space you have to work with. A few suggestions, and again, this is to mitigate the exposure to the particles you need. And it's just a general list, but you need to have the clear plastic sheeting tarps, the three to six millimeter clear sheeting tarps, several packs of those. You need to have duct tape. You need to have painter's tape. You need to have clear packing tape. You need to, where possible, get bubble wrap, the one inch diameter bubble wraps, the big ones, get a roll of that. You need to be able to have at least two or three good pairs of scissors or box cutting knives. You'll need to have heavy duty contractor garbage bags. So they look like the regular black plastic garbage bags that most of us have that are usually the 30 to uh, 35 gallon maximum. These contractor bags are bigger. They're about 45 gallon ones. They're thick, thick, heavy duty materials. You'll need a bunch of those. If possible, you'll want to get yourself the uh, foam in a can spray. It's usually used as a, a crack filler in like attics and basements for small gaps. You spray it in and it expands up. These are some of the things that you need to get and I'll explain why. Let's say for example, rule number one is you want to be away from outside walls and exterior walls as much as possible. Any radiation penetrating that energy, because that's what the radiation is, is going to penetrate through the outside and make its way through the inside. The more layers you have of material between you and that source of radiation, the more the radiation gets dispersed and it gets reduced before it gets to you. Now, as it goes, there are calculations that they've worked out that it takes so many feet of just dirt, just earth packed dirt to stop and reduce significant amount of radiation from penetrating. It takes so many feet of lumber, wood, of poured concrete, of steel, of human bodies. There's a measurement for all of that. But by and large, most houses, as an example, they have a thin outer layer, the siding, whether it's aluminum or it's vinyl, it's usually not more than a few millimeters thick. Then underneath that, there's usually plywood, even when it has the weather insulation barrier, which is a thin barrier of plastic, all of that, and then the insulation on the inside, the supporting studs, and then the drywall that's on the in on the interior walls, you're looking at maybe a section of about three and a half, four inches at the maximum. And it's of materials in such small amounts that it's really not going to stop any penetrating radiation. It will, of course, stop 
penetrating particles as long as you don't have gaps and cracks, as long as you don't have large areas of exposed surfaces where all that can get through. Now the best thing that you can do, it's not the only thing, but the best thing you can do is again, find an interior room that does not have any windows exposed to the outside. Once you've gotten that, you work on sealing off that room. Now, your entry doors, you, if you have one, then that's what you have to work with. If you have multiple, you have to decide what is your most common entry area and does it come directly into the room that you're going to isolate or does it open into an area that you then have to uh, travel through because you want to be able to reduce any potential contaminants that may come off of you or come into your interior without getting into the place that you're trying to keep safe. You basically don't want to have the only way in lead directly into the one room that's going to be your isolation area because any contaminants that get in, they're going to end up settling in that area where you're going to be eating and sleeping and staying and you've just nullified the point in trying to reduce your exposure. First thing you want to do is if you can, this is all working from the interior because I'm also going on the basis that some people may be on the third, fourth or 25th floor you want to look at your windows. Putting up painter's tape and using that caulk, if you have actual cracks, if you can either see light or if you can feel a temperature change of either cold air coming in in the winter time or even you feeling a cross breeze of air conditioning air being drawn out if it's warmer out, but you wanna fill cracks, use the painter's tape if you can to put it over those areas to reduce the amount of actual air space that can travel. You wanna look at two things, one, the glass itself, in the event that you feel a potential nuclear detonation may occur, depending upon how far away it is, it may not make a difference. But let's go on the basis that you're reasonably safe away from any of that. Using the clear packing tape, putting it as X's over your windows will help reduce the amount of fracturing. It's not going to completely stop, it will reduce the amount of fracturing of glass that may come through if there is a shockwave blast. The bubble wrap acts as an insulator also. A little bit of uh, soapy water sprayed on the windows. You've cut the sheets to measure out, put it up, press it in. It'll actually stick to the window. It provides a little bit of an insulator and it'll help again reduce the potential for shards of glass coming through. The contractor bags, those again, you use the painter's tape, holding it up over the window, keeping it in place, and then the duct tape to help seal around the outer edges. Now at that point, that window was blacked out. You're not gonna be able to see out of it and you're not gonna be able to readily open it up to use it. So you wanna make sure that these are windows that you don't have to worry about in the event that there's a fire or in the event that there's an intruder and you need to escape, you don't want it to be your escape window. These are gonna be the non-critical, non-use windows. So you do all of that. The room that you designate, whether it's a bathroom, whether it might be a hallway that actually has a door at one end and you can close the doors to all the other rooms, whatever the space is that you're going to use as your basically bunker area, you wanna look at taping off with the clear plastic tarp, putting it across the ceiling, running it down the walls, and don't have it in the thin, fully open sheet. You want three or four layers of thickness bringing it down the walls, inside and in the front to isolate the area. You wanna have it across the floor in section. So again, if you have to come in for whatever reason from the outside and you think that there might be a potential of exposure, you're going to want to remove the clothing that you have outside. And I'll get to certain stages that you need to do with that. But once you've got your isolation room, you wanna keep that almost like an operating room, as free and clear as possible. You wanna limit the travel in and out of opening up those sheets and going in and out as often as you can. So again, if you can put it near or in the bathroom and make an area there, that limits the amount of travel you have to go in and out from. But it all comes down to your layout. Some people can do that, some people don't. Some people have a wide open floor plan where there really are no hallways or isolated rooms. Other people have room after room and everything else. It all depends upon what you have. If you have a basement that you can use or anything else below ground, that's also preferable. You never want to go up and you never want to go out. You always want to go in or down. Now, in terms of contamination, the easiest, relatively easiest thing to do is if you have a bucket and you've got a little bit of water and soap and a brush outside and you've got a, a garbage bag set up in a bin. If you've been out there and you have reason to believe that you have been exposed, once you get back, that's outside. You basically 
pull a cover of a, sh a sheet or a towel off of it, take off the clothes that you got on because you're not going to be able to wash that off. You don't want that inside your house. Take off those clothes, scrub yourself down, do a quick rinse. You're standing in the bucket. You're basically head to toe, get out, and you have other clothes set up to put on and then come into the house. And then from that point, you follow your protocol procedures to make sure that you're not letting in a lot of dust and particles, leaving the door wide open and everything else like that. But if you think you've been exposed to radioactive particles, you don't want to bring any of that in. So you don't want to scrub and, and get in there. You just want to basically soak and rinse off. So the particles are loose on your hair. Don't go rubbing them in. Don't go shampooing. Just rinse it out, get it going, get your body covered, dry off, get inside quickly. You get dressed, fine. Let's say you've limited or reduced the exposure. So that's the first thing. You don't want to keep bringing stuff in and out when you're doing that. You want to stay inside and wait. And based upon the science of it all, from the time that the radiation is released to the time that it's decreased in its effectiveness or its uh, lethality, it'll still be several days to a few weeks depending upon how much was released and where it was. Let's say a reactor 1,500 miles away from you. And if you do a map of the US and you look, you'd be surprised how many people live less than 1500 miles away in some cases less than 50 miles away from a nuclear facility but let's say one went chernobyl that blast cloud radius could go out 50 to 70 to 100 miles and then when the wind blows it you have a long stream of radioactive cloud material moving through the air at different altitudes going up and down spreading out thinning and dropping and it might stretch a thousand miles so you may live a thousand miles away from an incident but the wind at that time and especially if you didn't check the weather could be blowing up in your direction over the next two days which means two days from the time that you hear about it on the news is two days later now that radioactive material is blowing through your town blowing through your area so if you had planned to bug out you should have gone when you first heard it to get ahead of wherever it might end up blowing when you're inside and the things that they talk about is one, limiting the exposure, but also two, preventative medicine as it were. Uh, potassium iodine is one of those things where it basically fills your thyroid and blocks out the radioactive iodine that is coming from the radiation. They have pills, uh, Thyrosafe, Iosat. I have that. I've got enough for my family for the several weeks that you estimate that you could be exposed. A lot of that stuff is hard to get. They do say that drinking regular iodine, the liquid kind in small amounts, can help in a beneficial level, but you have to have very small measured amounts because it will make you sick. And then it will also cause other problems, which then you're weighing the scale of the long-term problems that drinking too much of it can cause versus the long-term problems of radiation exposure. Either way, it's not gonna be pleasant. On a longer term basis, if you're already doing this, then it's a great benefit eating the right foods, seafoods, eating certain greens, I think like Swiss chard, um, broccoli as an example, spinach, they all contain natural levels of iodine in them that build up in your system. So effectively you're eating healthy, your thyroid is getting those proper levels. It's not going to stop the radiation from getting into your body. It's not going to stop the radiation from doing what it does naturally, but it will help reduce and that's all this is, is reduce the either amount of radiation you absorb or reduce the level of damage that could be done in the long term. Because, yes, people can die from radiation exposure in 24 hours, 72 hours, 96 hours, and people can suffer from exposure to radiation over the next 1, 2, 10, 20 years, depending upon how much they got. These are small little things that are going to hopefully help you in the situation. As I said before, it's all over the news because people are concerned that if this conflict between Russia and Ukraine becomes between Russia and everybody else, that missiles and bombs are going to start lobbing, that inadvertent accidents are going to happen. And sooner or later, everything is going to come swinging around and people don't want to get caught in that. And, you know, that's just the way that goes. But these are some small things that you can do. If you have gas masks, get those. If you have the traditional filter mask, what you still want to be concerned with is breathing in the particles. So again, even if you have the M95 mask, double up the layers, 
put on the disposable surgical mask over the reinforced M95 mask to give you additional layers that again if you think that you may have to venture out and there may be particles in the air, you want to keep as much protection between your lungs and the outside particles because that's where the issue comes down to. Now, if you hear about an incident 500 miles away and it only just happened 10 minutes ago, you're not gonna be exposed. But if you hear about a nuclear incident 500 miles away and you've checked the weather and you know that the winds are coming from that direction towards you, at two to three miles per hour, you can expect that there will be radioactive particles making their way through the air in your direction over the next day to maximum day and a half. So at that point, if you're planning on leaving, you need to be gone. If you're planning on staying, you need to start zip locking up your place and getting ready to stay inside and stay away from the outer areas as much as possible. If you have interior doors in rooms that you're not going to use, screwdrivers, take them off the hinges. You go back to, effectively speaking, making kid forts. You want to be able to take furniture, mattresses, sofas, things like that. Use the doors as a roof and put layers of material on top of that and you're sleeping underneath it. So you want to put as many layers of as much material as possible that you can over you. If you do have the fortune to have a house with some property, but you don't have a lot, again, if you've got a basement, you can do small things to reinforce inside the basement to basically make a room within the basement itself that you can then use as a shelter. Do a quick Google search on bomb shelters from the 1950s and you'll see there are plenty of designs. They, they literally are made with doors and desks to keep people safe. It's a small cramped area, but you weigh the cost of being shoulder to shoulder with your friends and family that are there with you versus lounging about outside and you know you're frying your cells from the inside out because you're completely unaware of the amount of exposure you're getting from all the radiation in the contaminated areas. I don't have certain materials and equipment. I would like to get it but they are unavailable and they were always on my list of oh I should get this next but that next kept getting moved down. So there are Geiger counters and dosimeters that you can detect the amount of radiation that's present and the amount of radiation that has accumulated. If I had to choose between the two, I'd rather have the dosimeter to see how much radiation I've accumulated within my area versus telling me that there's a particular hot spot in this location. You know, that's great as a warning, but I need to know what the overall amount of radiation I've been acquiring is versus where something is hot at that immediate time. Now, towards the end of this whole situation, which I hope there will be an end that is relatively, as it were, you know, amicable, we may not have to worry about it. But again, I'm not a political expert. I'm not a military strategist. I'm not connected to anything or anyone that knows anything at all. And I've made that disclaimer before that I'm not an expert at anything. I just know a lot about a little things. But towards the end of this, I'm hoping that at that point we reach it and things come out relatively decent where at the minimum, and it sounds strange to say, at the minimum, it's not going to be any worse than what it was 2019 going into 2020. That's the best that I personally can hope for. Anyway, that's it for now. Like and subscribe if you haven't already. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. Share this video with two people. One person that you like because that's a nice thing to do. And one person that you want to get under their skin because that's funny as hell. Anyway, take it easy.